disaster at sea. As terrifying as it is rare for millions of people on today's ocean cruises. Yet two tragedies, 100 years apart, remind us that accidents do happen. A century ago, the state-of-the-art passenger ship Titanic hit an iceberg. More than 1,500 people died. In 2012, the cruise ship Costa Concordia sank at the cost of 32 lives. Statistics show that cruises are reasonably safe. But with ships now carrying thousands of people, might another catastrophe be looming? NOVA examines cruise ship construction, design, and how captains are trained. All to understand why ships sink. Right now on NOVA. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the following. The David H. Koch Fund for Science. Supporting NOVA and promoting public understanding of science. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Additional funding is provided by Millicent Bell through the Millicent and Eugene Bell Foundation. More than 10 million Americans set sail on cruise ship vacations each year. This worldwide $33 billion industry has grown fast, as have the ships. Some of the ships have 6,500 passengers aboard and 2,000 crew members, more people than my hometown. As this industry and its ships reach for the skies, is enough attention being paid to passenger safety. Industry official statistics, citing just 16 deaths in the five years up to 2010, suggest cruising is safe. But since then, the tragic deaths on the sunken Italian cruise ship Costa Concordia raise new concerns. Disasters are rare. But is the risk growing? Potentially with huge loss of life, like the most iconic sea disaster of all time, the 1912 sinking of Titanic, almost exactly 100 years before Concordia. The catastrophes, a century apart, reveal astonishing similarities. That raises the question, are the massive technological advances of the past 100 years enough to guarantee our safety at sea? Such maritime accidents highlight important issues in ship construction, design, and the training of captains and crews. So are modern cruise ships tough enough to withstand the dangers of the sea? We will never be able to build a ship, large or small, to withstand an impact with a, uh, with a rock, or likely with an impact with an iceberg, for that matter. Are cruise ships now too large to be safe? And is it too easy to ignore their complex navigation systems? You're able to get navigational warnings. You're able to monitor other traffic. Uh, you're able to see how close you want to get to their points of danger. And do crews have the training to handle dangerous situations? The majority of the employees on the ship are designed to sell food and alcohol. You have only very few true professional mariners. Costa Concordia was owned by a subsidiary of the U.S. Carnival Corporation. It had a luxurious cinema and spa five restaurants, 13 bars, four swimming pools. Everything a honeymoon couple could have wanted. 
this was um, pretty much something we both dreamed of. It was a beautiful ship. Just the food, the, the sights, the sounds, you know, everything, just the culture itself, just a, a change of pace and just really looking forward to just enjoying ourselves, you know, on our honeymoon. There had been no safety drill for the passengers who'd boarded that day. International regulations allowed the obligatory lifeboat muster to be delayed for up to 24 hours after leaving port. Safety was like the last thing we were thinking of, you know, where's our life jacket? You know, we didn't think anything like that. What can go wrong on your honeymoon? Friday, January 13th, 2012. With 4,200 souls on board, the Concordia had just left port near Rome. Approaching the island of Giglio, the vessel diverted from its prescribed route, apparently to perform a sail-by just off the coast. Many passengers were at dinner. Others were watching a magic show when everything stopped. We heard a very unusual kind of grinding sound. Like, almost like fingers on a chalkboard type of thing. Plates were moving, silverware was jingling, glasses were jingling. This music stopped. The magician literally ran off the stage. The lights went out. We all just kind of looked at each other like, what is that? At 16 knots, nearly 20 miles per hour, the 114,000-ton ship had hit rock. 32 people would perish, and the world would ask why. That same question was asked 100 years ago after the maiden voyage of another giant ship, the Titanic. The men, women, and children on board, just like the passengers on Concordia, were also sailing into a nightmare. Four days out from England, heading to New York, an iceberg split open its hull. It sank within hours. More than 1,500 people drowned or died of hypothermia. The ghost of Titanic still seems to haunt its shipyard birthplace in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Here, thousands of laborers built Titanic for the American-owned White Star shipping line. She is the, the 747 of her day. She's designed as a giant people carrier. Nearly 900 feet long and 100 feet wide, Titanic was then the biggest man-made object to move on the face of the planet. Computer graphics can bring her first and final voyage back to life. The ship's journey was two-thirds complete by late evening on April 14, 1912. Despite reports of icebergs, Captain Edward Smith maintained speed to stay on schedule. Eleven forty p.m. ship's time. Titanic was approximately four hundred miles southeast of Newfoundland. A forty-five thousand ton ship heading towards a massive iceberg. This giant iceberg was a rogue. It had broken away from the pack. And by the time the two lookouts in the crow's nest had seen it and reported it to the bridge, it was too late. The Concordia and Titanic disasters bear remarkable parallels. 
Both cruised at speed into large underwater obstacles. Both hulls were ripped open below the waterline, piercing so many watertight compartments that they could not stay afloat. Could the quality of the steel used in their construction have been at fault? The answer is being sought here at the California Maritime Academy in Vallejo. Michael Strange conducts what's called a Charpy impact test on two samples of steel, one similar to that from Titanic's era, the other a modern day sample. We install a specimen into the machine that has a very special shape with a small groove in it, which focuses the energy into one location. The head is released, crashing into the specimen. The test measures how high the pendulum swings after it smashes through the steel bar. The higher the swing, the less energy has been used by the pendulum to break the sample, and the weaker the steel. The tests reveal that modern-day steel is seven times more resistant to impact than was Titanic's. This fits with earlier studies, showing Titanic steel contained more sulfur and phosphorus than modern materials. These impurities can accumulate between the crystal layers of the metal and weaken its structure. But the strength of a metal also depends on how much it stretches and deforms to absorb energy. Make sure they're nice and tight. Strange stretches sample bars to their breaking point. A stronger metal will stretch further before it breaks. You can see in the bottom third, it's starting to narrow a little bit. And it's just about reached its failure point. It's a little bit hard to tell, but it is quite a bit uh, longer than it was when it originated. If you look in the area of my fingers here, you'll see that it actually has reduced in diameter, and that area is called necking. Uh, that's where the forces and uh, stresses are the highest right before failure. In this case, the sample that fails to cope with the strain and snaps first is the Titanic era steel. Its quality suffered because the importance of controlling temperature during the smelting process was not well understood. In comparison to some of the older materials, for instance, the material used in the Titanic, they don't have the ability to absorb near as much energy as current steels do. Unsurprisingly, the metal of modern ships is more suited to surviving at sea than Titanic's. A more significant problem was the way titanic steel plates were connected. After hitting the iceberg, titanic stayed afloat for less than three hours. Iron rivets held the steel plates of her hull together at the bow and stern. They were her weakest link. In titanic, there would be approximately three million rivets this is an iron rivet recovered from the seabed from the Titanic. But this is actually the head of the rivet. This is the tail of the rivet. So this is inside the hull, and this is outside the hull. Riveting was a back-breaking job. Men were paid by how many rivets they drove in a day. They were known as the hard men of the shipyard. Titanic's rivets were heated then hammered through holes in two plates of steel. Cooling and contracting, the rivets pulled the whole plates tightly together into a watertight seal. So you have a steel ship, but it's constructed using iron rivets. Unfortunately, the rivets themselves are by nature weaker than the plates which they are attaching. And the head has been literally ripped off the top of this rivet. As the iceberg bent and buckled each plate, the rivets popped out, 
unzipping seams along a 300-foot section of hull. The iron rivets just haven't been strong enough to withstand the immense pressure of the iceberg striking. By contrast, Concordia's modern hull had no rivets at all. Sections were welded together. Below the surface, divers are finding solid rock, polished or cracked apart by the force of the collision. They've also come across an amazing piece of evidence. This twisted ribbon of solid inches thick steel, stripped from Concordia's hull, as though opened up by the key of a giant sardine can. The conclusion is unmistakable. Modern steel may be strong, but nothing can withstand the crushing impact of a 100,000 ton cruise ship on an immovable granite outcrop. You have to remember the weight of this vessel and the momentum. So even a very slow movement of an object this size just produces enormous forces, perfectly able to just strip the metal apart and shear it off like it's a piece of paper. We will never be able to design a, a ship, large or small, to withstand an impact with a rock, or with an iceberg, for that matter. So. The designers of the Titanic did try. Internal compartments with watertight doors were supposed to contain any flooding in her hull. But the bulkheads between those compartments did not reach all the way up to the deck above. Ultimately, this meant that the water would flow over the top of one bulkhead, over the top of another, and it was inevitable that the Titanic would sink. It was just a question of time. Bulkhead design has since been improved. In modern ships, they reach right to the top. All vessels have watertight compartments. Uh, this is a technology, a design feature that dates back to the Titanic. Titanic and Concordia had another safety feature in common. They had protective double bottoms, an extra watertight layer of steel above the keel. If the bottom of the ship is damaged, water still won't enter the inner hull but both Titanic and Concordia were struck above their double bottoms. Here, their only protection was a single layer of steel. The double hull isn't around the entire skin of the ship. It's usually just in the bottom area of the ship so that if a breach of the hull occurs above that, then you would have open flow of water coming into the vessel. The consequences were fatal for both ships. Concordia took on water and listed heavily. Only being beached near the shore saved her from sinking outright. Titanic, tragically, sank in the open ocean. In the 100 years between these two accidents, the lessons of the Titanic disaster were applied to ships such as oil tankers. Their double thickness hulls now reach right up to the waterline. But only some modern cruise ships have adopted this design. It's clear that you have a, an added degree of safety with a double hull. But full double hulls add expense. There would be cost limitations involved with that. Also, it may be a reduction in the amount of cargo the vessel could carry in a, in a commercial sense. The Cruise Lines International Association represents 25 lines. They and other major cruise companies declined to be interviewed about any of the issues raised in this program, including the design of the latest generation of cruise ships. This is a controversial area, 
and not all experts agree. But some industry figures question where these giant ships are headed. These ships now are being built in such a way that they are inherently unstable. It is a design issue. The first and most obvious design development of recent years has been the ever-increasing height of the ships. The tallest now in service reach more than 230 feet above the waterline, a 20-story building at sea. In strong winds, a high-sided ship acts like a giant sail, a concept illustrated by the collision between two ships off the coast of Cozumel, Mexico, in 2009. Oh, we're really close to these people, man. Look at that. Whoa, he's going to hit. Passengers on board the 88,000-ton cruise ship Carnival Legend took these shots as a 55-mile-per-hour wind sent the vessel veering out of control. Even her directional steering thrusters could not prevent her from colliding with the cruise ship, Enchantment of the Seas. In continuing high winds, the ships clashed for more than 20 minutes. It was a dangerous situation with costly damage, but there was no breach of the ship's hulls, and no one was injured. The towering height of these ships also raises the issue of stability. At the University of Michigan, Steve Zalek studies how ships float and why they sink. This 360-foot-long tank holds three-quarters of a million gallons of water. On accurate models, Zalek adjusts the weight distribution to mimic ships of all shapes and sizes fundamental concept between how any boat floats, large or small, is, is the relationship between its center of mass, its gravity, and the buoyancy of the volume of water that it displaces. They have to be in balance in order for the boat to float. A ship's center of gravity is the point through which all of its weight appears to be concentrated. The upward force making it float acts as if directed through its center of buoyancy at the heart of the submerged part of the hull. When the center of gravity is generally lower, the ship is generally considered a little more stable. Zalek adjusts the weights to more closely resemble the higher center of gravity of a cruise ship. By placing the same amount of weight on the ship, but moving a large amount of it to a higher position, so that we've raised the center of gravity. We've changed the roll characteristics. A lower center of gravity makes a ship more stable. The downside is that it rocks more rapidly from side to side, especially in rough seas. So cruise ship operators prefer a higher center of gravity. The ship rolls more slowly, making passengers more comfortable and fewer get seasick. Now that ship with a higher center of gravity is going to have a more gentle swaying roll, but that ship is not quite as stable, even though it may have better characteristics for people to ride on. The reason why the ship is less stable is that a higher center of gravity also makes the ship roll further from side to side. In extreme conditions, some experts believe this makes ships less safe. The ship should be designed so that when the wheel is put hard over in either direction, the vessel should not heel more than 10 degrees. In reality, some of these vessels are heeling to 20 degrees or even more. In April 2010, 60 passengers on the Carnival Ecstasy were injured when the ship heeled sharply as it made a rapid turn to avoid a buoy off Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. 
Such violent maneuvers should normally be avoidable with modern navigation aids. But 100 years ago, the ill-fated Titanic had nothing but the eyes of its two lookouts to warn of hazards ahead. On a calm, moonless night, with no white water breaking, they failed to see an iceberg until it was barely half a mile away. Modern ships have far more than a lookout's eyes to guide them. After five years as a master mariner, Rick Camo now runs this simulator in Rhode Island. This virtual bridge can conjure up every possible danger. Hey, Tom, if you could, uh, turn the rain off and add fog. It also has a full navigation facility. Uh, this is the electronic charting system, uh, very similar to the one that was being used on board the Concordia. And you're able to get charted depths, you're able to get navigational warnings, you're able to monitor other traffic, uh, you're able to see how close you want to get to points of danger. It really does allow us to have a bird's eye view of where we are and, and what, how close dangers are. But the state-of-the-art technology on modern cruise ships is only as good as the captain and crew who use it. So you can have seemingly well-designed and constructed ships with the best technology, but if you don't have experienced mariners at the helm, they can, they can find themselves in, in great trouble. Ultimately, we cannot design against human error. How do human mistakes sink ships? Costa Concordia's accident is still under investigation by Italian authorities, with human error as the prime suspect. My first reaction on seeing the Concordia run aground was, what was that ship doing so close to the rocks in such shallow water? The captain was 51-year-old Francesco Scatino. He joined the Costa Line in 2002 and took command of the half-billion-dollar Costa Concordia just four years later. Like all cruise ship captains, he also acted as the ship's chief of public relations and host. Good evening. Enjoy your cruise. Nobody has yet been able to explain why he allowed his ship to hit a rock that is marked on navigation charts. They have pre-programmed navigational routes that are embedded in their computers so that you can chart a safe passage. And if the ship, for any reason, departs from that safe itinerary, alarm should go off. Scatino has reportedly told the Italian authorities that he was navigating by sight only in the dark. Tracking data shows that he diverted from his route to perform a sail-by close to the island of Giglio. This is part of their entertainment. This is part of the drama and flair of modern-day cruising. For the Costa Concordia, it proved to be a fatal decision. 9.40 p.m. The ship was heading towards rocks at the edge of the island. By the time Scatino realized the danger, the Concordia was just 1,000 feet from shore. Too late to turn. The ship struck rock. This was not the only mistake that evening, and certainly not the only example of human error imperiling lives at sea. In 1991, a tropical storm threatened the cruise ship Oceanos off the coast of South Africa. The emergency shows just how a captain and crew's behavior can compromise safety. Some of the nearly 600 passengers were being entertained by guitarist Moss Hills and his wife, Tracy. None of them realized a serious problem was developing below decks. Mm -hmm. 
most ships have small openings below their waterline to pump water in and out. In the battering from the waves, a crucial valve had failed. Oceanos was taking on water. Suddenly, we seemed to hit extra big waves, and you could hear these really loud crashes as these waves hit the side of the ship, and we lost all the power, and the lights went off. Below deck, seawater had reached the generator room, knocking out all power. It started to be sort of 15, 20 minutes, no lights, no announcements, and the ship really started to lurch heavily onto one side now. It wasn't even returning to an even keel. Water was collecting in the bowels of the ship, pulling the vessel to one side. There were no alarms, no warning signals, or anything that anything had gone wrong. Um, in fact, it was just, there was just nothing from, from anybody. We saw some of the crew starting to get little bags, sort of duffel bags and rucksacks and, and running up the stairs back up to the top side of the ship. And we thought, well, you know, there's, there's something very bad going on here. Disturbed by the crew's actions, Moss went to investigate. I wanted to go down below and see exactly what was happening. Carrying a camcorder and recording everything, Moss realized they were in big trouble. Deck, there's water everywhere. It looks like it's flowing in reasonably fast. It's sloshing about from side to side. When I suddenly saw all that water, that was a huge shock. <clears throat> the failed valve was now letting water course through every pipe in the ship's plumbing system. Traditional watertight bulkheads couldn't stop the water. The pipes passed right through them. The seawater exploded out of toilets and sinks all over the ship. Oceanos was flooding from the inside out. In despair, Moss raced to the bridge. Went up to the bridge area and it was completely abandoned. It looked in a bit of disarray. There were binoculars lying around and sliding around and charts had fallen onto the floor. And it's just not a, a sight that you expect to see. The missing captain was later discovered smoking a cigarette under the stairs. Many of the crew had fled in a lifeboat. No, still no announcements, still no officers to be seen anywhere. And we started to realize we were in charge. Moss grabbed the ship's radio. That's it, Mayday. And he said, right, well, you know, what is your Mayday? And I said, you know, with the cruise ship Oceanus, we're sinking. What rank are you? I said, well, I'm, I'm not actually a rank, I'm a guitarist. And he said, well, what are you doing on the bridge? I said, well, there's nobody else here. And he said, well, where's the captain and the officers? I said, I don't know. We said, do you know where they are? Moss and the other passengers waited nervously for help. Eventually, more than a dozen South African Navy helicopters arrived. You could see them flying in, and, and that was an enormous sense of relief. It was almost like a movie. Arriving on deck, a Navy rescuer brought bad news. He said, we can see from up above, when we're looking at this ship, it's definitely going to sink. It's, a lot more serious than you think. We're not even sure we can get everybody off. Aware that they were running out of time, Moss helped the rescuers lift passengers to safety. So I went through a very fast training period with him on how to work the harnesses and how to give signals to the helicopter pilots. After helping everyone else to escape, 
it was Moss and his wife's turn to be saved. He's yanked us in, and, and we looked down, and we realized just how close to the water we were and how terribly close to sinking that ship was. The Oceanos had now taken on too much water. As the ship fell onto her side, water rushed to her bow, dragging her under. In the aftermath of the sinking, there was an unusual defense from the captain who claimed he had given an abandoned ship order. When I order abandon the ship, it doesn't matter what time I leave. Abandon is for everybody. If some people they like to stay, they can stay. Captain Avranas was convicted of neglecting his duties. But there may be an explanation for this kind of inaction. Ed Gallia models human behavior in extreme situations. This uh, is what we call behavioral inaction. What you find is that the person freezes. The situation is so overwhelming for them, they just don't know what to do. Ed Gallia's theory of negative panic might help explain the errors made on board both Costa Concordia and Titanic. Despite a distinguished career, official inquiries found fault with Captain Smith of Titanic for steaming too fast into an area known to have ice. While some credit his actions in the rescue efforts that followed, others find more to criticize. If you look at his actions on the night of the 14th, 15th of April, he really failed not only the passengers, but also the crew and himself. With Titanic sinking fast, Captain Smith failed to ensure that the lifeboats were filled as they should have been. Now, in an emergency, in a crisis situation, in a dead flat calm, a lifeboat could certainly carry perhaps 70 or even 80 women and children. And instead, some lifeboats left the side of the Titanic with a handful of passengers. As a result, the death toll was far higher than it needed to be. Some reports claim that Smith failed to take charge as the crisis worsened around him. Now, is this negligence? Criminal negligence? Is this a complete failure of the command structure on board? Or is it that Captain Smith had some sort of mental collapse? I think it's Captain Smith had a mental collapse. I think the magnitude of the coming disaster was just too much for him, and he was paralyzed. 100 years later, could the Costa Concordia's captain also have been overwhelmed by events? One fact is certain he failed to ensure that his passengers knew the ship was in danger. They were left confused by the lack of any useful information. We were asking him, what's going on? What should we do? They would tell us, we have no information, we have no information. We just really didn't know where to go. And some people were screaming, go to your cabin. And some people were saying, go to the master station. And ended up just standing around, just waiting and waiting. You know, what, what do we do from here? The lack of directions made a bad situation even worse. You need to provide them with accurate information. You don't want to give them too much information so that they're overloaded. And you have to provide the information in an authoritative way. When people don't know what's going on or they don't have a firm grasp of what the, the, the gravity of the situation may be, they'll start to panic. Then, 10 minutes after the collision, 
all the lights went out. Passengers were literally left in the dark, told only there was an electrical fault. We have the captain to inform you that due to an electrical fault, which is currently under control, we're currently in a blackout. Our technicians are working to resolve the situation and we'll inform you of developments as they occur. Cruise Line was saying everything is fine. So that was that was false information the cruise line was generating. Despite the crew's reassuring words, some passengers suspected that the situation was getting worse. Just seeing the look on the staff's face, you know, deer in the headlights look, it just kind of sunk in. This is for real. My wife and I looked at each other, and we said, they're full of it. I said, we have to get off the ship. Different people reacted in different ways. Some simply could not grasp the reality of the situation, that the ship was sinking. Well, at first, when I saw the water starting to seep into the hallway, I ignored it at first. Like, it's not really happening. It just, you know. I mean, we were in denial. That just doesn't happen. That doesn't happen on your honeymoon. And it's not possible in this day and time that a huge cruise ship like that could sink. Denial can be a normal reaction. The initial response is, um, actually not to respond at all. There's a, a, a tendency to uh, continue doing what you're doing, um, and, uh, and it takes some time before the people actually disengage from their normal activities. Other passengers decided to see for themselves what was going on. We decided to go up to the 12th deck and see for ourselves what was going on. And we looked over the rail. The ship is leaning, and it's leaning more and more. We knew this was so serious. Finally, around an hour after the collision, Captain Scatino gave the order to abandon ship. At this point, it literally was too late. He had run the, the, the clock out on his own passengers and crew. Lifeboats were quickly filling up with panicky passengers. These men were just pushing and shoving their way into the lifeboats. We went to one lifeboat, and it looked like it was getting full, so we went to an, the next one. The full consequences of Captain Scatino's delay in ordering abandoned ship now became clear. Concordia was listing heavily. Lowering the portside lifeboats turned into a nightmare. This was Nancy and Mario's designated lifeboat. It was listing mm, probably about 20 degrees or so, maybe a little bit more. And as the lifeboat was lowering, it just dropped and went into a free fall. And all the people went flying to one side. This is when we really, really thought this was it for us. And then you could hear, as they were lowering it, it just screeched down the side of the ship. It just scraped. And then finally, we got on the water, and everybody just clapped. Meanwhile, Captain Scatino had left the ship, claiming he accidentally fell from the side into a lifeboat. In addition, he refused the demands of the Coast Guard that he return to his post. Adesso il chiamato, alzi sorco di lei. È un'ora che mi sta dicendo questo. Adesso va a porto, va a porto. E mi viene a dire, e mi viene subito a dire quante persone ci sono. Sta subito 
andando perché ci sta l'altro l'ansia che si è fermato. Lei va da bordo, è un ordine, lei non deve fare altre valutazioni, lei ha dichiarato l'abbandono nave. To be able to understand the situation as to what's going on, you have to be on board the vessel uh, to direct that. You have to see what's going on. There is no forgiveness for abandoning ship and leaving your, your charges uh, somewhere else. The behavior of this captain, if it is true that he left prior to all the passengers being evacuated from the ship, it runs entirely against um, every code that I'm aware of and all the behavior of every captain I've ever met. Scatino never did return to his ship, but hundreds of his passengers remain trapped on board. Honeymooners Megan and Robert were looking for a way onto the boat deck. I don't think either one of us ever ran as fast as we've ever ran. It seemed like that hallway's forever and ever. Just trying to get up to those stairs, and it was harder to run because it was tilting at that time. But even once on the deck, they could not find a usable lifeboat. Nobody was really helping. It was just pretty much every man for themselves. They were fresh out of options. That's when I turned to her and I said, that we're going to have to swim. Rushing to the starboard side, now listing towards the water, they saw a lifeboat passing below. And we leaped over the railing and dropped down, I'd say, a good eight to 10 foot drop. The couple was amazingly lucky. They landed on the lifeboat just before Concordia finally rolled on her side. Other passengers were forced to make a frightening hand-over-hand -hand descent in the dark on a rope laid across the capsized ship's hull. It was almost like a dream when we finally got onto the, the island and just looking back and just seeing what we had just come from. 32 people never made it at all. It took months to recover some of the bodies. Francesco Scatino was placed under house arrest, facing charges of multiple manslaughter, causing a shipwreck, abandoning ship when passengers were still on board, and failing to communicate with maritime authorities. But as the inquiries continue, it emerged that some credit may be owed Scatino for acting to save the lives of hundreds. One of the decisions that apparently was made correctly and, and certainly saved lives was getting the ship onto the beach and putting it in a position where it wouldn't sink into deep water. The chaos of the Costa Concordia sinking has thrown a spotlight on the standards of training and emergency preparedness for crew members even those whose duties mainly involve passenger service. <laughs> Following his Nautical Institute graduation, Captain Scatino worked for 30 years as an officer on ferries and in the oil industry. But he had only worked on Costa Line ships for four years before captaining his first and ultimately only ship, the Concordia, from its launch in 2006. This is an industry that's exploding. There's only so many of those truly experienced, professional, mature mariners. Training in a simulator could help cruise ship captains to react more effectively in stressful situations. Many major lines do insist on their captains taking simulator training for two weeks each year. But it's only a voluntary arrangement. In aviation, by contrast, Ongoing training is a legal necessity. Training is, is really important in really emergency, life-threatening situations that the personnel can just slip almost into automatic pilot and, and their behaviors become almost a, a natural reaction. Ideally, mistakes should be made and lessons learned on a simulator, not in real life. We have had some people freeze up. Uh, that happens, that's okay. You know, this is the place to do it.
In the marine industry, we are probably 20 to 25 years behind what the aviation industry does. But simulators will only have an impact on marine safety if they become a mandated part of crew training. The main difference between the aviation industry and simulation and the maritime industry and simulation is their governments of countries who oversee the FAA here in the United States, they require simulator training for their pilots. It's a, it's a law, it's required. We don't have that in the marine industry yet. The question now is, will the Concordia disaster produce an improvement in training and safety throughout the cruise industry? as the sinking of the Titanic did a century before. This is an opportune time to take a look at the size of the vessels and the way that we operate these vessels. The cruise industry is reviewing safety procedures in light of the Concordia disaster. Lifeboat drills are now held before a ship leaves port. It's not yet known what other changes are in store. But has the sinking of Costa Concordia decreased the public's appetite for taking a vacation cruise? Even guitarist Moss Hills, despite his traumatic experience aboard the sinking ship Oceanos, retains his enthusiasm for life aboard ship. In fact, when the cruise ship Achille Lauro caught fire 125 miles off the coast of Somalia in 1994, there was a familiar face among the entertainment staff. It was incredible. I, I could hardly believe that I was on another ship that was, was sinking. It just it didn't seem possible, but it, but it was. The fire had started in the engine room and spread through the ship. Moss was once again involved in helping passengers escape, but even that hasn't kept them away from the sea cruise for many years after I sank twice and I've never had a problem again and I still love it. <laughs>